We're going to talk tonight for a few moments about a conversation with God. And so Mike's passing out notes. If you're watching online, get out. you can get out your Bible, flip over to Genesis 15. And Jim, I almost called you on this the other day because remember we did a Bible school together on this. And um, man, this chapter really, it gets under my skin. Um, Jim and I did some Bible school work together on Genesis and uh, probably one of the coolest classes we did, right? Like, it was amazing. And I was going to call you to kind of pick your brain and see if you could, like, maybe do this message, because that would be really good. to be an upgrade for sure. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about Genesis 15. And we're continuing a series, Conversation with God. And I like to frame this in terms of prayer. And I believe that prayer, ultimately prayer, just to dial it down to the, the most simple, basic explanation, definition, prayer is conversation with God. It's and it's not a monologue, contrary to some of the ways we do prayer, um, but really by design, it is intentionally organized, structured to be a dialogue, a conversation. Dialogue meaning two, dialogue, back and forth. And so the first um, dialogues that we looked at, conversations with God, the first one was, you can see on your notes here, it was with Adam in Genesis chapter 3. And uh, this conversation was initiated by God. And he came to Adam after Adam had eaten the forbidden fruit. And he said, he asked him one a question. Remember what the, the lead word was in that question? What, yeah, thanks, Barry. What was it? Where? Where? Where are you? Not what did you do? How could you be so stupid? What a moron. He didn't do any of that stuff. Because God inherently is relational. And he wants to connect with us. No matter what we've done, haven't done, Failures, flaws, shortcomings, deficiencies, pick something. God is still saying, I want to be with you. Where are you? He's looking for us. He's looking to connect. And then the second conversation, and if you notice on your notes here, it says that this was remedial. So this conversation was to remedy, the remedy, the, the sin, the disobedience that Adam and Eve had done. It's a, it's a remedy, remedial. But the second one was with Cain in Genesis chapter 4. And this is Cain and Abel. And we did this a couple of weeks back. And this one, the, it starts off not remedial, but he said, but God comes to Cain and says, why? Why? Why are you upset? This had to do with the different kinds of offerings. Why are you upset? And he, it's interesting that Abel never answers God. And what, what God is trying to do in this conversation, the first question is to prevent. To prevent... Cain from killing his brother Abel, bottom line. But it doesn't work. Cain refuses to have the conversation with God and instead goes out, talks to Abel, and then kills him. And God continues the conversation even though Cain had, had screwed up. And I appreciate that God, not only does he try to prevent, but then he'll come back on the backside of it and try to remedy and repair it. Follow what I'm saying? So just because you've screwed up, doesn't mean God can't remedy, can't redeem, can't come back and fix and, and reconcile. Anybody glad about that? Amen. Holy buckets. Probably online you're glad too. So let's look for a brief moment tonight at Abraham, and technically it's Abram. So if you're watching, you're like, hey, you could better get your name right. You're absolutely right. It should be Abram because his name has not been changed to Abraham yet in Genesis 15. So in verses 1 through 6, you're going to see that this whole, well, the whole chapter is basically a conversation, dialogue between God and Abram. And this dialogue, of all of the conversations we've seen so far, and I think it's also very distinct and unique for the entire Bible. I mean, this, this conversation, and we're going to do it, I'm going to do it in two parts because it is so rich and robust and there's so much to it that kind of makes your eyes pop out of your head. So we're going to look at part one tonight, and then we'll do part two uh, the next time on a, I'm on a Wednesday night. So part one, again, God initiates the conversation. And if you look at verse one, chapter 15, verse one, it says that uh, after these things, the word of the Lord, I'd like for you to circle the, the word, word, word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. I'd like for you to circle the word vision. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. 
and I want to kind of accentuate this because when you think of vision, what what do you um, what sense what sense goes with vision? Is it feeling, touching, smelling, hearing, seeing? Vision goes with the sense of what? Seeing, right? So vision and sight go together. When you think of word, do you think of sight initially with word? If, I, if you think of word, what, what sense goes with word? Most of the time hearing, unless you're reading, right? That would be the one exception, you read the word or whatever. But when we think of the word, the word word initially, we think in terms of hearing. So I want to point this out to you because I think it's very interesting that it says the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And I want you to appreciate that there's a mix of these two senses of seeing as well as hearing. And it's mixed together. And when you have a conversation with God, it's very important that we don't anticipate or frame or constrict how that conversation happens. God mixes these two senses together, hearing and seeing. And it doesn't, for your logical mind, and especially for like just regular conversation. If I'm talking with Pastor Aaron, we're having chit-chat, and I can call him on the phone and I can hear him. You can FaceTime and you can see and hear at the same time. So I guess in some respects, this was kind of an interesting way for God to like FaceTime Abram, right? A little bit, sight and sound together. Um, but I want, to, I want you to kind of push the envelope that God doesn't always, isn't constricted to your natural senses in the customary human-to-human -human way of interacting. That God can mix your senses to communicate with you. Hopefully that blows your mind right out of the gate. You're like, wow, that's verse one. I know, that's what I thought too. I was like, woo, let's keep going. So you can see why we're going to do part one and part two. So he says to Abram, in a vision, don't be afraid, Abram. I'm a shield to you, and your reward will be very great. So these bullet points here on your notes. The first one, seeing the word of the Lord. Be willing to let God, to sense God and unique and illogical ways, ways that don't always follow human conversation, human communication. There are a lot of times, what does this look like? There are a lot of times, and I found this in my own life, that I'll be doing something, and I'll get this little flash in my mind where I, like, I see something, and it's like it's a little bit of a direction. And it was interesting, a couple weeks ago, I was standing, we were doing church here, and I was Sunday morning, and I was... I've been trying to press into the word of wisdom, word of knowledge better, you know. And uh, there I was standing next to a lady, and I was just real quiet, and I kept hearing this name. And I was like, you know, that name thing, you keep doing that name thing, God, and I'm not really happy with how that's been turning out lately. This was the mental dialogue, you know. I'm like, I feel like you're leaving me out to dry here, especially in front of all these people. But I felt like I kept hearing, and, and I was quiet. So initially I argued, but I was still quiet, and I kept having this little faint little echo in me, like, hey, tell her this name. So I was like, well, at least it's not in front of an audience. I could just do one on one. It's not near the, like, you know, the, the ten, ten, tension of it. So I said to her, do you know anybody by this name? She's like, absolutely, that's my mom. And uh, my mom's been going through, and she started telling me some of this stuff, and I was like, woo, because that was exactly what God was telling me, downloading. And so I think sometimes we have to be conscious that God speaks to us in ways that we're not always, that are not always just exactly like humans, um, and being aware and being tender and sensitive and, and responsive to it. And so the second bullet here, God says to Abram, I'm your shield, which means God's going to protect. God is Abram's bodyguard. I like that. It's what a warrior carries into battle. God is your protection. God is your shield. And I think this is very essential for us because the world that we live in can be a little bit hostile, can be a little bit aggressive and combative, but God can protect and be a shield for us. And then also God says, your reward will be very great. And I want you to appreciate that God is the one that initiates this conversation speaking through vision and he tells Abram some really cool stuff and 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 it's interesting Abram's response to this because Abram says back in verse two and three 
oh Lord, and I want you to catch the, 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 the difference here. Because in the first two conversations with Adam and with Cain, God is the one asking the question, right? In this one here, God initiates the conversation, but it's by a declaration. He's communicating. He's, he's making a statement. He's not asking Abram anything. He's not commanding him to do anything. And if you, if you, just to give you a little background, some of you may look and say, well, God had conversations with people before Abram. And I want to just let you know that when you look at what God spoke to Abram before, like Genesis chapter 12, if you go back to Adam, or sorry, Noah, and you look at what God spoke to Noah, none of those things were conversational. They were only God telling Noah or Abram, do this, do something. So it's a command, it's an imperative. So there's a big difference between a command. I tell my kids, empty the dishwasher. That's a command. It's not a conversation. If I keep doing the command thing with them, they're going to get tired of that and feel like we're not very relational. So with Abram, this isn't a command, command thing. This is back and forth, a dialogue. And so when you look at Abram's response, God's first thing to him is a declaration. It's a sentence. It's a statement. But Abram... <laughs> is the one who asked the question now. So instead of God asking the question, which we saw with, with Adam and we saw with Cain, now Abram is saying, what gives? And what he says here, O oh Lord, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Abram said, since you have given me no offspring, one born in my house is, no one born in my house is my heir. And I like that not only does Abraham says, okay, or Abram says, okay, you know, my reward will be great and you're my protection. Fantastic. However, what about, and he asks a question and then he not only asks a question, he brings up the topic. I have no offspring. I have no inheritance. The only guy that's going to get everything that I've got is Eleazar and he's a servant. He's hired. And so I don't have any, any kind of inheritance. And so Abram pushes the envelope and starts to say, okay, if, you're, if my reward is great and you're my shield, well, what about tomorrow? What about the future? What about the offspring? What about where, where are we going with this? What's, what's going to happen when I'm dead? And I like what God does. And then in verses 4 and 5, the word of the Lord came to Abram and said this, this man will not be your heir but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. Now, I want you to look at verse 5. Then God took Abram outside, and he said, Look to the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. He took a walk. He took a walk and said, Come on, Abram, let's go, let's go take a walk. And... I, I think this is really important because it is very much just, it's not supernatural, it's not demonstrative, it's not the earth opening up, it's not the, the stars shooting down from the sky, it's not these animals that start talking. I was reading about Balaam today and the talking donkey, you know, that was really exciting. And none of that stuff. It's just this simple, clean, easy, Regular human thing. Let's take a walk. And I think this is very, very important. I say this because, I don't know, a friend of mine started talking with me last year, and he said, you know, Sarah, you've put on some weight. I was like, wow, thanks for that helpful observation. We were having breakfast, and uh, I know this gentleman well enough to know he's he may not have the best diplomacy skills, but he certainly got a good heart, good intention, right? And so I was like, well, that's interesting that you noticed that. He's like, you know, if you wanted to take something, do something really easy, why don't you just take a walk every day? Walk up the street, walk 20 minutes, and it doesn't have to be some like, because he knows me well enough to know, I like this high octane, super intense, you know, when I get in, I'm like all in, and then I injure myself, and it backfires, it's all this bad thing, right? Mojo goes down the toilet. So he's like, just take a walk. And I was like, well, you know, that's really an interesting thing. Maybe I'll do that. And I started. I started taking a walk. And I kind of fell off the wagon 
it's around Christmas, so clearly we need to get back on the wagon. However, one of the things I noticed from taking a walk, and you're like, this is stupid, is there a point to this? I noticed that as I took a walk, and I did it consistently, like five days a week for, I don't know, a while, and as I took a walk, I'd walk out of my neighborhood, I'd walk up to the street, and I'd usually walk down to the firehouse and then come back. And then I found a second route, which was even better. I was really excited about it, around this pond up over Peoria. And, and I started doing these walks. And what I found was when I first started walking, I'd get out of the house, I'd stretch my legs out, I'd just start walking. And it kind of would clear my head. But then, as I walked, once I got into the walk, about five minutes into it, seven minutes into it, I started having these really cool God times. And I didn't put on my headphones, and I wasn't talking on the phone. I wasn't doing it. I was just taking a walk. And it was nice. I did it recently, and I was like, you know, God, I just started talking. And it was interesting because a lot of times when I take this walk, I'll start pouring out my heart. But after I'm done, then I have this stillness, and then I sense God speaking back to me. And I think there's a lot to be said for a conversation with God by just taking a walk. Simple. And you're like, that's not very complicated. It's not. But super, super helpful. And, the, and if, I can, if I stay in a routine with it, then I find that my, the depth and the, and the intimacy increases and grows. There's a richness to it. And there's a connection. And there's a simplicity to it. It's not like I'm you know, sweating my brains out or anything. But the point of it is, I, it's like my physical body is engaged with doing something, so then my head and my heart can kind of connect and stay, stay focused better. So God takes Abram out and says, hey, let's take a walk. I love that. I love it because it's just simple, easy, and it's the human thing, right? Humans, we walk. And you can walk a little, you can walk a lot, but walking. He takes him out, but then what he says is this. Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able. So it's walk and look. Look. Count the stars if you're able. And what happens is he's framing here and he says, this will be like your descendants. And what God does here is he's endeavoring, he's changing Abram's perspective. You're looking at what you have here on the earth. You're looking at the limited and the finite. And family, let me just encourage you. When you have a conversation with the infinite, you're going to need to change your perspective. <laughs> Something's got to shift. Because the infinite will trump and always exceeds finite. And so when you have a conversation with infinite, who is God, then you're going to have to look at the things you're seeing just in a natural context with the limits and the boundaries and, and, and stipulations, terms and conditions. And you're going to have to say infinite trumps the human terms and conditions. And I like this because we know when we say it in our better moments, God's ways are better, higher than our ways. We know that, right, in our better moments. But I think when you take a walk and God says, hey, I, wanna, I want you to look up. Stop looking around and look up. And then finally, you notice here, listen. Walk, look, and listen. Abram could have taken a walk and kind of just done that. as crazy, stupid stuff and blown them off and not listened. And again, conversation is that dialogue. It's back and forth. And so when we walk with God and, and God starts speaking with us, it changes our perspective, changes how we see things, changes where we're looking, changes kind of the framing of what we've seen and what we've experienced, frames that. And then it also challenges us to listen. Yes, talk, but also listen. And so when Abram does that, he goes out he, and he walks with God. And God says, I want to change your perspective and your descendants. You look now and you don't have anybody from your body, but your descendants are going to be like the stars of the sky if you could ever count them. And so what happens is this. Are we willing to let, and I say this on, on the notes, are we willing to let God change, challenge our perspective, our assumptions? Are we willing to let God change our vision of the future? I think a lot of times we, we look at, at the past and think that's got to be the predictor of the future. 
And if there's no conversation with God, then absolutely, that's, that's the continuity. However, when we have a conversation with God, the past cannot be the defining and limiting factor that defines the future. And this is what, what God is doing with Abram. You can't look at the past. You can't look around you. And you can't, especially, again, conversation with infinite is not going to define and constrict. We can't let that happen in our conversation with God. And I like this because Abram had the proper response, proper reply in verse 6. It says, then Abram believed in the Lord, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. The proper response is, okay, I believe. And family, you don't have to understand to believe. I think that's really, really important. So many times we want to question why and how and when and what does that look like and can you describe that a little bit better and all this stuff. And we do that. But Abram, his initial out-of-the-gate reaction was, I choose to believe whether I understand or I do not understand. My, my belief is not limited to my understanding. And I think so many times we get the cart before the horse with that. If we don't understand it, then we don't believe it. And if that's how you're going to define your belief is based on your understanding, you're going to live a little microscopic world. It's very tiny and small, and it's not living large and living the DNA God's put inside of you. You've got to believe, and I find this. A lot of times when I choose to believe first, then often understanding will follow. I believe, I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know why, I don't know in what way, but I know I believe. I choose to believe. And sometimes you have to coach that mental game and say, okay, I choose to believe. I choose to believe that God is bigger than what I see. I choose to believe that nothing is impossible with God. I choose to believe that God is bigger than me. Because some of us, we have our own skeletons in the closet and deficiencies and weaknesses and frailties. We're like, can you handle me, God? Absolutely. I choose to believe that I'm not impossible for you, God. I choose to believe that I'm not too stupid. I'm not, or maybe I am, but you're bigger than my stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I am too weak, but you're bigger than my weakness. Maybe I am too, too self, a lack of discipline, but you're bigger than that. I choose to believe and walk in that belief and faith rather than the unbelief and, and limited by understanding. And so as we finish a couple quick things, I'd say to you, number one, and this goes with the first verse, are we willing to see, hear, and sense God in ways that don't always follow logic or human experience. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. It's the mixing of two senses, hearing and seeing. Are we willing to let God come to us in ways that aren't the human, natural human that we understand and always know? And are we willing to let God kind of expand our, our sensory perceptions. Maybe blend some of them. Maybe it's not only sight and sound. Maybe God blends and, and you feel something. And then you see with it. Or maybe you hear. Maybe you taste something. Maybe you smell and it's like, oh yeah, and it causes you to see. And so are you willing to let God blend some of these sensory perceptions so that you can have this interesting and, and mind-blowing conversation <laughs> with the infinite? So in what ways, I think, I think you just need to ask yourself, am I, uh, let me be open to that. Let me be open to some of these differences. And then number two, I'd say this. T these are action points. Literally, take a walk. Just take a walk with God. Around the block. You say, well, I don't have a lot of time. That's okay. And I appreciate that it's kind of cold. Um, today is very cold. Tomorrow it's warming up. And I looked at the 10-day forecast. It's going to be super nice. Friday, it's above freezing. Awesome, right? Fantastic. So take a walk and uh, bundle up. It's okay. You're going to be fine. And uh, don't do it at night, but take a walk. <laughs> number two, or number three, let God, let God determine your focus. Let God determine your vision. And, and let, let the infinite trump your human finite. I just want to take this exercise for a quick moment and ask you to take a second here to consider, and there's a little space on your notes here, 
Would you, is there, what area in your life, um, what area in your life needs a change in perspective? A change in perspective. You're like everywhere. Well, that, you know, okay, everywhere. Now let's narrow that down and pick one. <laughs> pick, pick one that seem, might be easy for you or pick one that might seem really hard. What area in your life needs a change of perspective? It can be in your marriage. It can be in your finances. It can be in the way you see yourself. You frame yourself in some of these things that have happened. Maybe it's a, a job situation. A friend of mine was telling me today about a housing scenario. And uh, he was saying, you know, I'm struggling with the house thing. And this is interesting because it's making me expand my vision change the perspective so I'd like for you to write down one area where your perspective needs to change how many of you can find one I liked what Tyler said during worship about God framing our plans you know sometimes our plans don't you know it doesn't go something doesn't go to plan and so what you see from what Tyler said is God changed his perspective shifted it and said, I got something different. So what might be an area? Maybe you're a planner and you kind of need to change. Think of a different perspective. How many of you have something? Everybody online, same for you. All right. So I'm just going to pray for you for a moment on that area. And if you want to put it in your hand, after you've written it down, just hold on to that. Some of you have had, and I think this is some people online, you've had a bad report from the doctor. It's an infertility report. And uh, you, there needs to be change in the perspective because you, the doctor's report has been discouraging and very, very disheartening to you. And the Holy Spirit is saying, um, don't be limited by human understanding and human finite. God is infinite. Abram thought he was infertile too, right? And Sarah, they both, they laughed. Sarah laughed. <laughs> and then the joke was on them because they had a son named Isaac whose name meant laughter. So never let human definition and medical reports constrict and define an unlimited God. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now for each of us in this room, each person watching online, these areas that we've written down, we've identified, need a change of perspective. I pray, Holy Spirit, that as we walk with you, you'll change, you'll shift the way we see things. You'll shift our perspective and our outlook. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, from Romans 8, that you would help us to set our mind on you and not on the impossibility, not on the finite, not on the limit. Mindset on the spirit is life and peace. So we choose to let you change our perspective on ourself, on a person, on a situation. Even change some of the way we see the past. We say yes to you changing our perspective. Thank you for helping with us with this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And then the last thing I would say is, listen. In a conversation with God, listen. Pour out your heart, absolutely. But don't run away after you pour out your heart. Listen. The best is yet to come, right? Time to listen, time to just... And, and sometimes, you know, I always like to say this. I think sometimes in a conversation... There's moments, if you look at a conversation, a conversation between people who are very comfortable with each other, there's moments where there's pause. There's moments where you don't have to fill it in, fill in with words and stuff. If you don't know somebody very well, then there's, you always, there can be this, like, somebody's got to talk. You know, you just got to talk. But the better you know people, a lot of times you can kind of relax and you just, you don't have to have all the conversation. You just enjoy the company, Right? 
And so there are times when you may ask God a question and God may not answer your question. Maybe God just enjoys your company. You're like, well, I need an answer. Well, in good timing. How about in God's timing? And you being impatient, you being cranky about it and prickly, you know, kind of settle down. I'll bet you God has a better plan, better timing, better solutions, provisions than you ever thought possible. (laughs) So listen, enjoy God's company, and let's keep up the conversation. Amen? So this was part one. And the next time I do a Wednesday, we'll do part two. And uh, the second part is like the animal splitting part. You're like, what does that mean? Literally, they split animal, they split animals. Like multiple animals, they cut them in half. And so it's kind of like the butcher story. Like, how does that relate to a conversation with God? Well, you have to come back and get the second part. So God bless you. Have a safe drive home. Reese is preaching on Sunday. It's going to be on community continuing. And uh, be sure to collect your children um, uh, after church real quickly because they all want to go home and it's school night. So God bless you. We love your guts and we'll catch you on Sunday. Have a great day. Night. Safe drive.